leads off, we're going to start talking about monsoon just a little bit. Um, the, the root of the word comes from an Arabic word, masoom, which means season or wind change. And that's exactly what happens. Um, our, our wind direction changes and we start getting warm, moist air up from the south. And so this warm, moist air gets here um, and with our warm summer days, those warm air masses start rising. Um, and when they, they rise, they eventually get high enough in the atmosphere, they start getting uh, cool and, and they condense and fall as rain. And officially our monsoon season in uh, Arizona here has been designated from June 15th to September 15th. Um, and here I have some data from rain log I don't know if many of you are familiar with rain log, but this is one of the things that I think is a great tool. And this is through the University of Arizona, um, but anybody can contribute to it. Um, so I'll zoom in so you can see these numbers more. Um, before that, I'll just remind you. So this is data from February 14th till June 14th. So this is our dry season right before the monsoons. And so we zoom in here and take a look around the county at some of these numbers. And, you know, the most really we got anywhere was just over an inch of rain during that long stretch from, from February till June. Um, to contrast with that, here is our rain log data from, oh, we're still on the same one. Okay, here we go. So here's one from June 14th till September 13th, just yesterday. So this is during our monsoon. And so we can see the contrast of how much more rain. There's a few spots here that are, are close to 20 inches, most places at least around 11 to 13, over here in Bisbee 17. So, you know, it's really just a, a wonderful, magical time of year when we get all this rain and our landscape really flourishes and, and changes um, it really, really greens up and it's, you know, quickly become my favorite season uh, living here in, in Arizona. Um, and I'm going to switch over just for a second because I wanted to hop on just to show you a little bit more about rain log, where to find it and, and how to use it so that you can um, look at some of this data on your own or even go to contribute data if you want to start um, measuring the rain you get uh, where you live. So I'm going to stop sharing that and get rain log ready to share. All right, so uh, we see rain log now. Um, I'm gonna move this over a little bit. So, so it's just rainlog.org uh, and you can zoom into your area um, on the map. See, it's mostly Arizona and you have a few options. You can do a date range like I was showing. You can do monthly totals or you, or you can just look at one specific day. So let's just throw a, a date range in here. Uh, so let's do something similar to what I had before. So let's look at that monsoon time frame again. So we'll do June 14th and we'll end it with today. And we'll hit get report in just a second. And zoom in a little bit more close to where we are. So I'm gonna hit get report. And then it populates with with all that data. Um, and this is a great tool. And I love how localized it is. You can get real close to where you live um, if there's if there's some data being collected there and get a little bit more uh, precise rain data to where you are, because it really can you know, vary from from place to place. Okay, so to get back to the 
PowerPoint. Um, now we're going to switch from talking about um, monsoon a little bit once we establish those dates as June 5th, 15th till September 5th, 15th. And now we're going to talk about migration some, but you you already see kind of uh, some similar time frames here of, you know, we have a chart down here where migration for these birds really starts in uh, in August, early August, but it doesn't really he can pick up till September. And this is this migration of these birds is triggered by a few things. Day length photo period is one of the big ones. Um, lower temperatures and changes in food availability. Um, so they, you know, people have kept birds as pets for a long time. And there were studies long ago where uh, the migratory species that people would, would keep, they, um, they would get restless in the spring and the fall around migration times, and they would actually tend to stay towards the southern end of the cage when they were in this, you know, mode biologically when they were supposed to be migra migrating, but they were kept in a cage so they were unable to. So photo period, you know, even though those birds had, you know, all the food they needed in captivity, there was still that biological trigger um, with the, the day length. Um, and today uh, we're going to focus on uh, the passerines. Um, so this over here, we have some examples of uh, expect expected nocturnal migrants, um, and and this is actually from uh, from this week uh, from Birdcast and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology on what they expect to be coming through this time. But we're going to focus on the Passerine, so that would be the summer tanager, the yellow warbler, national warbler, um, not the shorebirds. Um, so we won't be touching much on the shorebirds today. But um, so a lot of these nocturnal uh, nocturnal migrants, uh, part of the reason they're they're coming this way is changes in food availability, and you know further north where they live, it's getting you know, colder, shorter days, and also less food. Um, but with our monsoon, uh, we have a time where we're kind of peaking uh, with a lot of food availability. Um, so uh, I also wanted to mention that, so the reason that, there's a few reasons that these birds migrate at night. Um, during the day, you have raptors migrating. They use the thermals from the heat of the day to help soar and, and spend less energy flying. Um, and so the, the passerines are doing their migrating at night, one, to avoid those predators, the, the raptors that are using the thermals during the day. Um, but they also do it because it's a good way for them to save energy. Um, there's usually less turbulence um, in the sky when they're flying at night. Um, and they're, it's also cooler, so they have a uh, better rate of heat exchange. They're able, you know, when they're flying hundreds of miles, uh, they burn a lot of energy and that creates heat and they're able to cool down pretty efficiently flying at night. Um, so, um, so I wanted to put together a, a little closer look at some of these birds that, um, that bird casting the Cornell Lab of Ornithology are predicting, you know, are coming through migration right now where we are. And um, one of these is, is a Grace's warbler. And so I just wanted to give you an idea, you know, we already established that they eat insects and we're at a time now here with our monsoon when there's a great availability of insects for these birds moving through. Um, but it does, look like, you know, they they breed in our area a little bit, but we'll be getting, you know, some of these more northern birds, you know, they're going to be coming through um, and, and spending the winter down here in the blue area. Um, uh, another one, another warbler um, that does a lot of insect eating. And so this one, the, the red, again, you can see that they do breed somewhere where we are, but also look how far north they go all the way up through Canada and Alaska. And so some of these birds are going all the way down to South America um, for their winter. So some of these birds are moving, you know, thousands of miles to get to where they're going. And 
it, you know, from my experience working at a bird banding station, you know, one of the things that we always check for on condition for these migratory birds is, is their fat. Um, you know, because they are going so far and, and so long, their, you know, their fat is really important for them to be able to, to make it through. And so, you know, places like where we live and they're coming through foraging on, on insects on their way, way south, you know, it's, it's important that they have those stopovers and places to feed along the way. Um, here's another one um, that they say to keep your eye out for, the Nashville warbler. You know, another big insect eater I have down here. Um, and so this yellows migration. So they, they really just have a small uh, portion where they breed up here, but then, you know, they use all this area to get back to their wintering ground in, in Mexico. Um, Bell's Vireo, um, same thing as some of these other ones. They do breed some in our area right here in southeastern Arizona, but we'll still probably be getting some migrants that are, you know, finding their way south from further north of us. A um, couple more species they have on here. We got a couple tanagers coming up. Here's the summer tanager. Um, same thing, uh, breeds close to where we are, but, uh, but they have a long way south um, a lot, a lot of their winter spent here in Mexico, and then uh, the the northern end of South America as well. Um, now our western tanager, um, they have a pretty big breeding range throughout the west here, um, and then spend their winter down in Mexico. Um, and this is the last one that's on our list, and. You know, of of the species we've talked about, this one uh, eats the least amount of insect matter. They still have them listed um, through Cornell Lab of Ornithology as a bird that, you know, primarily eats insects, but they're also a growth beak. And, you know, from the shape of this bill, you know, they use it to, to crack a lot of nuts and seeds. Um, but from what I read, um, as far as insect matter goes, they, they mostly eat beetles, um, which, you know, can have a harder shell sometimes, so it's easy for them to, to crunch through that. And I've, I've been bitten by gross beaks before. They have very strong, powerful bills, but again, a, a large portion of their diet is also insects, um, and they occupy a lot of the West here um, and, you know, will breed around where we are, but we'll be getting extra, extra birds coming through um, with with migration now. Um, and so another tool that I wanted to talk a little bit about is is this bird cast. And so um, it's something they've worked on for for years and years. It's a, a big collaboration between the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and Colorado State University and uh, UMass and a bunch of other um, members. But basically, they've been able to pick up uh, migrating birds on weather radar. Um, and so that's exactly what you're seeing here. Um, and so I just picked out a couple days um, where we had a lot of activity in, in our area. Um, and you can see back, back east, they got a lot of movement. Um, but this August 28th, we were having a, a pretty big day ourselves for for migratory birds coming through. Um, and here's just another example of one of these maps um, from September 6th. And this is another day where we were having a lot of action around, uh, around Southeastern Arizona. Um, and so now I'm, I'm gonna switch over again because I, I wanted to give you a little thorough more thorough run through of, of BirdCast. Um, I think it's a great tool and I've been using it the past few years to kind of track when a lot of migratory birds are coming through and uh, now starting to use that feature I showed you about um, the, the expected birds, um, birds that they expect. So I'm gonna stop sharing this one and I'm gonna pull up BirdCast. Um, so there's a few things here once you get to the home page of BirdCast. Um, so this is 
their predictions. Um, so they usually do a, a three day prediction of uh, where they expect the highest volumes to be. Um, so here's the 14th, you know, we're on the lower end of things, but there's some parts of the country that, you know, they just have more habitat, more birds, and, and so it'll get a lot brighter on this map, higher density in other places than, than where we are. Um, so there's the 14th, the 15th, a, a little lighter, not just where we are, but everywhere a little lighter. Um, and then the 16th, a little bit lighter still. And these, um, these masses um, up here, these are actually storms that they have put in here. And, and I've definitely noticed that the storms can affect um, the migration of the birds. They'll kind of try and circumvent the, the storms or you know kind of be delayed because of the storms. Um, so that's part of why they put that on there is because it does have an influence on, on exactly where these birds travel when they're flying. Um, and then here, uh, this is their live, live map and you can go back and look at any day you want so i'll just go back and do that september 6th day um so there's with this moving there's a few more added parts that i didn't talk about too much but um on our guide here you know it tells us there's going to be a, a line coming across for sunrise and sunset and so if you just kind of keep your eye on our area here there's there's no bird movement going on yet. And well, that's because sunset hasn't happened yet. So we're not getting those, you know, nocturnal migrating pass readings yet. Uh, but once you see the line come across for sunset, then we should start seeing more movement where we are. So there it is, sunset. It's coming across. And then once the sun has set, then you can see all these birds starting to move and, and migrate in our area. And it, you know, keeps going through the night at uh, varying intervals. Then we have sunset coming and then it all dissipates out. Um, so that's the live migration map. Um, but another thing I wanted to show you is this migration dashboard. Um, you can search where you are. So usually I've just been doing Cochise County. Sorry, technical difficulties. Um, so the dashboard, usually I can just type in Cochise County and then Maybe try a different night. I didn't think I was trying to do a night. Um, mm. I'll try reloading it to see if that helps. So we'll just do cheese. Huh. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure why I thought we were trying to find data for the 15th. Let me try one more time. Well, it doesn't seem like that's wanting to cooperate right now, and I apologize for that. I tried it earlier. So God, what if work. you change it to, to a different night? Yeah. Aha. All right. That's what we were looking for. Sorry, I didn't realize uh, what was going on there. But so this is this is more um, this is similar to what I had shown you before. Um, and so over here it has, you know, the, the volume by days stacked on top of um, historically historically how many birds we were seeing. And then it has the list over here of uh, expect expected nocturnal migrants 
and this is going to change week by week, you know, uh, there's going to be different birds moving through at different times. So this is just a snapshot of what they're expecting, um, you know, the past couple days here. Um, All right. So I went through um, the expected nocturnal migrants that we had uh, listed and, and overviewed there for you. And uh, I just kind of went over their diets of insects that they eat. Um, and there was a lot of overlap. Um, you know, some of them are more special, specialized for certain things than others. Um, the, the tanagers like to eat a lot of bees and wasps. I already mentioned the gross beak, you know, eats a lot of beetles, but there's, you know, other things that uh, they like to eat too, flies and dragonflies, caterpillars, ants, leafhoppers, cicadas, craneflies, sawflies, and termites. Um, and so I, I went through um, high naturalist for right here in Cochise County, and um, I just took some of the most uh, um, and the most common species uh, for some of these groups that are seen around here. And so, so for this first one of, of beetles, um, we have a uh, blue fungus beetle, glorious jewel scarab, western red-bellied tiger beetle, um, and a fig eater beetle. And so it has these maps of, of observations and almost all of these, you can see they really have a burst in monsoon. This this blue fungus uh, beetle, you know, comes out earlier than the other ones, but you know their peak is right here in August at the you know the beginning of migration, and they're still around you know during the the peak of bird migration. Um, and we just see this repeatedly in these graphs that you know here June June to October for the jewel scarab. You know that's when most people see them. Um, and that's that's when they're also available. Um, same thing with the Western red-bellied tiger beetle. You know, they might get start getting here a little bit earlier. They start coming out in May, but they have their peak right right there between July and August. Um, and then we go to the fig eater beetle, and same thing. It's it's got a uh, <clears throat> a peak of when when people are seeing this beetle right in the middle of monsoon and also right right during the peak of migration as well. Um, so uh, then for flies, um, agave fly, you know, same thing. We all a lot of these these charts are similar, even though they come out earlier in the year, you know, they're here in the spring and all through the summer, but like they really have their biggest first in numbers right here along around monsoon um, and during part of migration as well. They kind of peter off here at the end. Um, and then we have uh, the sinuous bee fly, you know, same thing, their, their peak. They actually seem to do best right at the beginning of monsoon um, in June, and then they kind of decline some, but, but same thing, you know, they're just very abundant during our monsoon times. And I don't I don't think this is anything I have to harp on too much for everyone that lives here in, in the desert. It's pretty pretty obvious when the monsoons come that there's um, there's more insects around. I know I've noticed a big difference um, when I'm when I'm out. You know, I before monsoon came, I never thought about mosquitoes and then suddenly I was getting uh, bitten by a lot of them. Um, here we have a robber fly. It looks like it just has a, a real short window where people had been seeing it um, from, from July to September. Um, and this one was a minor bee. Um, and same thing, you know, kind of June to September during the monsoon is when you see them and they peter out after that. But uh, they provide, you know, great forage for these migrating birds. Uh, dragonflies, we got a uh, blue eyed darner. Um, you know, I just find this fascinating looking at all these, um, all these graphs and, and see when they're most abundant. Um, same thing with the darner, most abundant in our monsoon time. 
And the flame skimmer, same thing, June, July, August, September is when they're peaking. Uh, this variegated meadowhawk, uh, it looks like it peaks a little later. Um, and they actually see it more in the fall. Uh, and, you know, some things just have different life cycles. I don't know exactly uh, exactly why that is, but they seem to do well later in the year. But they're, you know, this tail end the monsoon, they're doing real well, too, from August till September. Um, and I actually saw some of these great, great spread wings earlier today, and they they have their peak right here in September, right uh, coinciding with the, the peak in bird migration um, as well. Uh, some of these leaf hoppers, um, this one has a kind of a two peaks here, uh, one in May, and then again right here in August and September. And we got a couple more species of leaf hopper. Um, but again and again, you just see these graphs where they really peak in, in the monsoon time when there's you know lots of rain and lots of vegetation. And, and that's really great for insect production. Um, uh, here, since the ants, bees, and wasps, and sawflies are all closely related, I just grouped them together because um, I didn't want to be too redundant at this point. Um, but here's a Sonoran bumblebee in their graph. Uh, desert leaf cutter ants, which I really love. Um, we have our Comanche paper wasp that uh, same thing. August, September is when they're most abundant. So uh, to me, it was just uh, really cool to see this connection of of you know all of these insects that are about and available in the desert, and then also that the magnificent timing, just like nature always does, of of when these migratory birds come through, um, and 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 how they're able to utilize that resource um, when they're when they're moving through here because they they really do need it, um, and you know, I think that's just a, another emphasis of, you know, how important our, our water resources are um, and the ecological functions that um, that our our water serves. And, you know, our program here for WaterWise, we, we have a lot to, to offer the community. So I, I think most of you are pretty familiar with the program, but, you know, we, uh, we will do uh, <clears throat> rainwater harvesting consultations and uh, xeriscaping consultations to try and use more desert adapted plants and um, uh, we can help with irrigation and so there's uh, you know a, a number of things that we can do we have we're working on a new low water plant list um, so we have lots of educational materials and things you can uh, do and think about to to save water and you know contribute to uh, you know, contribute to helping our our community because it's something that you know, especially where where we live, it's something that they, we got to think about and keep in mind. Um, so, with that said, we're going to uh, move forward and open the floor for uh, questions. I have my my citations here. So Christy asked earlier um, if we would be able to contact more people close to the border, particularly near the, the San Pedro River to participate in the, the water log or the rainlog.org. Right. Um, that is a very good question. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but um, so it, it is through the U of A. One of our colleagues, Mike Crimmins, is kind of um, in charge of that, and that's a question I could definitely uh, pass along to to Mike because he helps helps manage that whole whole program. Uh, but I think more data is better. Um, so I, I think that would be great if we could get that involved. We'll we'll check with Mike. Thank you, Christy. I think I think that Trevor, there's very good participation in Sierra Vista. Wachuca City, not too much, but like in Douglas, I was only one site, one in Naco, mm -hmm. and there's, you know, there's a bunch of private homes to, very close to the border. Um, yeah, yeah, and that's, you know, area. 
and you That's... know, you see it come and you think, I wonder what's, you know, and they probably monitor at the river, but you can't really ever get the data right. Yeah. Yeah, so, and that's part of why I wanted to do a little demonstration to get more word out about there about rain log, because I do know there are, there are those, those gaps, because um, same thing, I, you know, I used to work at Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge, which is a few hours west of here, and I was telling my boss about that resource, but there's just no one really collecting over there, so it's, it's great data, but you got to have, you know, people contributing, and well, you don't even have to do it daily. If you talk to Michael, if you miss, you know, you can accumulate and um, average. You don't have to. I love daily reporting, but, you know, I now we try to stay home during monsoons. But, yeah, you know, because um, it's a good time to be here, right? It but, is. I don't know. I, I, I've been to several workshops where they talked about it and with Mike Crimmins, but bring it up with him and see if we get more in the southeast corner especially in along the san pedro <clears throat> yeah i wonder if that's something also that could be brought up with like the because i know that the like the watershed management group does the the binational beaver study stuff and so maybe like mike foster would be someone to kind of just remind about the the resource that is rain log um just in case they aren't that's not part of their you know, repertoire of things to recommend to people. Or to reach out in the rural area, get in touch with the active uh, management for the new, you know, water. AMA. AMA, yes. I couldn't think with the last one. The AMA people could maybe, you know, spread the word. And of course, those people are going to need to start collecting, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I, yeah, I, I agree. It would be good to you know have have data especially in those areas where changes might be implemented um so that you know because we'll we'll have some data from you know wells and a dwr but it'd be nice on the flip side to have data about the rain and what's coming into the system as well mm -hmm. um i was curious about the so the insect graphs that you got um, yes. Were those from um, the from the birdcast, or like that seemed another kind of tool that was maybe not mentioned, if it's separate. Yeah, from yeah. Thanks for bringing that up, Alex. So that that tool was iNaturalist, and that was not one that I went over um, in this presentation. Mm -hmm. But iNaturalist is something that anyone can download on their phone, and essentially. You take uh, take pictures and then it, you can submit it. Um, whether you know it or not, other people can help you identify what it is. Um, so it's it's community source uh, and people can verify your identifications or make suggestions of of something else. Um, and so that was all all from iNaturalist. And not only was it from iNaturalist, but they were only observations here in Cochise County. Um, so it was it was focused on you know the insects that people have been documenting uh, around our county. And were those graphs um, based off of that crowdsourced data, or um, okay? Wow. Yes, yes. I'm the, surprised the that graph there's enough is, data. Yeah, yeah. And so there's there's some that I I didn't include because um, I think the group of midges I tried looking up, and there were only I. I handful of observations so so there wasn't very much good data so i tried to try to focus on the ones that were most common because they had the most data um that i felt you know more confident in since they've been viewed so many times yeah iNaturalist is really wonderful so for anyone that hasn't used iNaturalist before i highly recommend it you know you can take a picture of anything a plant an animal an insect you know insects are animals but put them up online and um it'll give you a whole slew of potential answers as to what the program thinks what you took a picture of is and you can choose something and if you're wrong an ecologist will find it and tell you <laughs> 
Um, so it's really great. Um, I have a question that is uh, kind of multifaceted, so I'm, I'm sorry if it's a little overcomplicated. Um, but I was wondering how do you how do you think local water conservation efforts impact migratory and residential birds, both in the San Pedro and on an individual scale? And this um, is I, I know I, this is like <laughs> I, I might need you to repeat that because I think I got about two of those things. Do you do you mind repeating the question, please? No, no, I it's a long one. Um, how do you think local water conservation efforts impact migratory and residential birds, both on the San Pedro and uh, think of like on an individual house scale? Um, I don't know so, if it does on an individual scale, but. Yeah, so, so I think um, me personally, you know, it, it's gonna vary year to year because not every year do we have a good monsoon, right? So, so there are going to be years where, you know, like the first year I lived here in Arizona, where, where we just don't get that much rain in the monsoon. And so you might see, you know, uh, effects trickle down the ecosystem where, you know, maybe that year there are less migratory birds that survive because there's, you know, less availability for them. Um, and so to me, that, that just emphasizes how, how important, you know, our water conservation is both both during monsoon and uh, and not, you know, I've been kind of focused and thinking a lot about um, the, the wet dry mapping and, and those real dry periods when there's not a lot of water availability. You know, if if we are able to make a bigger impact with our water conservation and, you know, making sure more gets back into the aquifer, that should, you um, you know, provide more, more water in those dire times, you know, our normal dry seasons, and then also uh, the, the poor monsoons or the non-soon years that we do end up with, you know, I think you're going to see, see a bit bigger impacts um, because, because they, we do end up with those dire times when, when it is so dry that, you know, there's, you know, gaps and stretches in the river where, where the water is not connected. Um, so I think, uh, and, and I do think, you know, on an individual basis, um, you know, we may not feel like we can make a huge contribution individually, but I think it's about, you know, mindset and, um, and, you know, kind of community, uh, having everyone in the community on the same page that this is an important issue, um, for our water. I, I hope that was uh, at least most of what you were looking for. Yeah, I think that I think that mostly mostly answered it. And I, one of the reasons I asked, so I was thinking a couple years ago, and it was during one of these non-soon events. Um, I was reading an article about a group of migratory birds that uh, died. Uh, I think it was over White Sands um, National. Uh, monument or park over in New Mexico. Um, so I was thinking about, you know, whether or not, you know, things like the San Pedro and even on an individual scale, if we could offer, um, you know, standing water, if that could help those migratory birds and kind of alleviate some of the pressure from those migratory birds um, that they experience when there's no monsoon out here. I don't know if that made sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh that is a good question. I don't think that I have the answer to it. Um, but it, it is a good question and something that yeah, maybe is that's someone like a needs to question. research into, yeah. Um, Amy, there's one thing is that we are blessed with a lot of people that love birds and I personally put out two or three water bowls and keep them clean because of the birds. I don't always put food out, but there's a lot of that going on here. And um, that's awesome. A Arizona Game and Fish does put out water stations, right, Trevor, for um, in areas where they know there's a lot of wildlife, which of course the birds would use. Because even in the Wachukas, you know, our streams go dry and, you know, springs don't run. And so, but they do get, I think our birds here get a lot of supplemental water at least, Amy, from 
<laughs> that's comforting <laughs> that's comforting yeah. I was wondering what that looks like you know for these birds that have traveled so far and they come out here and if it's a bad monsoon and there's no water for them so that's yeah I'm glad I'm glad there's people putting water out yeah water in my house. Our, <laughs> yeah our, our neighbors our neighbors have a little water feature and I uh just yesterday I saw a black-headed gross beak you know one of the birds that was expected on our list was was right at their their a little water feature and getting some water so so they definitely so, use it you know I am curious as to so if you put out those water features um you know whether they're from you know rainwater catchment or whether they're just from your tap or wherever um do you think that would have an impact on the birds like layover do you think they might spend more time there where there's water especially in a poor monsoon season it's it's definitely definitely possible you know i i i can't say for sure you know most of the the bird the re research and work i've done with birds has been other places but definitely you know the bird banding station i worked at in western north carolina we would have migratory birds that they would come and we would catch them and we would weigh them and they would stay in the area for a few days we'd catch them a couple days later and they would weigh more because they have been feeding and trying to put on more fat, you know, before the next leg of their journey. And, you know, the reason the bird banding station is there is because it's a special place ecologically. Um, and, you know, we're, we're also a very special place ecologically um, for these birds to move through and, 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 you know, forage during migration. Um, and so in general, I, I would say that, you know, it, it'd be very possible for birds to stop and stay here longer, whether water would be a big enough draw or if they would, you know, need to find more food with that. And, and, and if they wouldn't be able to find as much food during a, you know, non-soon non, non season, you know, if there's not as much insect availability, then I don't know if they would move on and try and find somewhere where there is more. Um, so that's a another good question. Yeah, I was kind of thinking it would be interesting to compare the the bird migration activity and the insect um, availability to say 2020, where you know it mm -hmm. had been a long time since there had been any any rain, and you know to see how do they act differently? You know, do they tend to to stay in one spot? Do they migrate less? Do they migrate in hopes of finding more food like I or I guess is in your saying I guess they maybe just die in certain cases which is very sad but yeah I was like horrified by that a few years ago because it was hundreds right. of them that seemed to right. just but it, of course it was you know white sands which is a very yeah. even more area than we are yeah. okay I, I have a couple things and I'm gonna this is gonna embarrass me but I will ask the questions so the birds fly at night I thought they all just went to bed <laughs> I had the same question for him <laughs> you know like, yeah why <laughs> so yeah so it's, it, it's it, it during migration yes typically typically yes they do fly during the day you're right but during migration the actual like big you know like hundreds of miles they'll fly will be overnight and then during the day, then they can forage on the insects. And so they're still flying around during the day, but it's the big movements that they're making overnight when it's when it's cooler. And then when the raptors aren't out, um, of course they still gotta worry about owls, but the, the you know, the the hawks and falcons, um, you know, those guys are migrating during the day. So they're kind of switching off. Yeah, you're you are right, Sharon. They fly during the day, but then for migration, they they utilize the cool temperatures at night, um, and then try and avoid the predators. Because I am, um, I have some big mulberry trees in the back, and I get all kinds of birds. So I keep a book for a book here. So because I get the tanders, I see all that, and they also I have an irrigation system. I have a small spot for green grass. Um, and I also irrigate, you know, I took Jan's class and irrigate my plants, but they play in the water. Yeah. You know, when my sprinklers are on, I could have 20 birds in the lawn. Okay. <laughs> and they're loving it. 
And what I do is I put my bird baths, I have just a couple of them. I used to feed uh, water bees, but um, so when my water system is running, it's feeling the, the bird baths for the birds. Also, I noticed with uh, this is a heavy monsoon this year, which, which is great, but they're also the birds are drinking in the street in the puddles. I don't know if you guys see a lot of that, but so I think they're getting a lot of that water and I, and they definitely have my house scooped out for who waters their lawn. <laughs> yeah. I see them and the water's not wasted as far as I'm concerned. Um, because they're also feeding on the insects in my lawn too. Once the water yes. So. Yes. Which is it's great for us that they're feeding on the insects because it makes our lives a, a, a little bit easier, but but, you know, before I, I never really been, you know, super interested in entomology, but this year I've had some cool experiences. I got to um, go on a collecting trip with the uh, inverted brick keeper from the Sonoran Desert Museum. And I, I just kind of realized how cool and interesting some of the insects can be, um, even though they're not as big and charismatic as some of the other wildlife around. Yeah, don't don't kill tarantulas because tarantulas. Um, people don't know this. I don't know how many here do, but you know, to get a mature tarantula it takes like eight to ten years. So if anybody's squishing a tarantula, because I've seen them up um, coming trying to get in my garage, not this year, you know. But tarantulas are very slow going, and um, and in southern Arizona, I grew up, we had tarantulas everywhere. It really mm -hmm. bo bothers me that that I don't see them anymore. Um, but they're, it's not like a one or two year insect, you know. These babies can live to be 10 years or more. So treat them like gold when you see them. <laughs> I'm generally a spider saver. Yes, she has saved. <laughs> I, I guess I, you, them, you I, I work people with, would know. <laughs> yeah, I work with Trevor and, and uh, Alex, and I used to work with Amy. So, but yeah, whenever there's a bug that I don't want to see or deal with, you know, Alex, I'll save it and Alex will come in and get it for me. <laughs> I don't care for sun spiders at all. But yeah. one thing, Trevor, is what eats mosquitoes? Mosquitoes was not on the list, was it? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, a lot of the birds on, on our list, uh, they're gleaners. And so what that means when they feed, they'll be um, either checking leaves or checking bark for bugs. Oh. Um, and, and so since mosquitoes are always flying around some more of the the species uh, that are fly catchers and that you'll see um kind of like our king birds are one that i immediately thought of you know there's some some birds are designed more to fly out and catch things real quick from a perch um our, our black phoebe's uh, another bird that has that same behavior so those are the type of birds i'd more expect to um eat mosquitoes based on their uh, their feeding behavior. Um, so yeah, it was the birds on that list. They're mostly going up and down trees, searching the the bark for bugs. Uh, Do bats of... maybe eat mosquitoes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I was kind of wondering too, because I mean, I don't think that do bats migrate. Uh, some some bats do. I'm not as familiar with their migration. Oh, as I there's am. they so. definitely. I just don't know if it's like a long scale thing. Cause I mean, I know like when I lived in Tucson, like there's the bridge that's uh, like Campbell and river and everyone was like waiting outside the Trader Joe's and I'm like, what's going on? And everyone was waiting for the, for the sun to set for all of the, the bats to fly out. And it was super cool to see, but I'm just kind of like, where are they going? And also it made me wonder if there isn't a certain, like if there's a certain amount of the, the bird cast thing that, um, tracks um bats as well or if you know they're able to somehow distinguish between them or what but yeah just... so so yeah that's a that's a good uh good point and actually from what i have read um it can pick up uh movements from from bats um mostly what they've seen is is emergences like when they come out of a cave um and partially especially like those big roof sites um they can also tell because of the direction and you know that's a lot of what is going on with the bird cast too is you know they have you know this historic data of of people seeing and documenting these birds moving through places and then they can you know mirror that with what they're picking up on the radar 
Um, so, so I think with the, the bats, they are able to kind of, they weed that out of the bird cast because um, they know where some of those big emergences are and gotcha. like the, the way they're coming out of the, you know, cave and roosts. Um, but I, I even read that they have been able to pick up a mayfly, uh, mayfly, mayfly emergences along the Mississippi River, which mayflies are a, a aquatic macroinvertebrate that they have a short life cycle where all of them hatch essentially the same day. They're in the order Ephemeroptera, and it's called Ephemeroptera because they have such an ephemeral adult life stage. It's just like one day. So they hatch and they molt once and then they're adults and they breed and, and they're done. So there's, you know, like millions of these that will hatch at the same time. And it's enough and enough that they're able to, to pick it up on the bird cast from that as well. Well, I know that the, the bats right now, because um, the big room at Karshner Caverns is closed. It doesn't open until October because the bats are in. Okay, so they're definitely, so it'll open back up in October, so they won't be roosting there anymore. They have been traveled down. You know, the Borderlands put on a, um, I watched one of their seminars on the on the bats, the Mexican bats, and also the special that was on PBS, and they talk about, because, you know, bats, we need our bats. And I see them here every evening at dusk, when the birds mm -hmm. stop flying, then you see the bats come in, and they'll hit the nectar feeders. But yeah, I, you know, Campbell, what you were talking about, Alex, up there is right next to Pima County Co-op Extension Office. It's right yeah. across the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So I've never gotten gotten up there to see them. I went out and checked when I went, was there in December, but they're long gone in December. Okay, so I didn't get to see any, but you know, I guess it's, it's quite the spectacular ordeal to go up and watch them fly yeah, out to cool, feed. For sure and eat all those mosquitoes. So yeah, I, I love bats almost as much as I love birds, maybe more. <laughs> they're, they're pretty great. I haven't been up there for um, for one of those emergencies either, but I've, I've, I've heard they're good. So I think everyone needs to put that on their list. We really do appreciate you taking the time to uh, to be here and to listen and, and learn and ask some questions. Um, I had a good time and, and appreciate it. So hopefully we'll see you at more events in the future. Yes, it was really great to see you all. Thank you so much for coming.